Trump. This is the crucifixion. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. Many people don't understand Donald Trump. They don't understand what he is. And this means that they fail to understand his many behaviours. As I explained many years ago, in a blog article that I wrote, and then more recently videos that I'd done, that he's a narcissist, and as per my categorization, he's what I determine as upper lesser type B, an individual that doesn't operate with a facade, what you see is what you get, successful, brash, bold, belligerent, bullying and boastful. My categorization of narcissists helps you understand more about what makes them tick, what they'll do, what they won't do, which gives you assurances and understanding. And if you want to understand more about the different types of narcissists with regard to lesser and mid-range, then access HG Malls. You'll find that in the Knowledge Vault link in the video description. But by way of example, Vanity Fair suggests that this is the crucifixion. It is, but not in the way that they suggest. To show you how people don't understand what Donald Trump is and what makes him tick, an article by Bess Levin in Vanity Fair states as follows. Happy almost Easter. Hey, speaking of Easter, do you know who apparently views himself as a Jesus Christ-like figure whose current trials and tribulations are not unlike being nailed to the cross? If you guessed Donald Trump, you guessed right. Yes, Rolling Stone incredibly reports that the former president, who was indicted last week because he paid a porn star named Stormy Daniels $130,000 to keep quiet about an alleged fair, was offered a chance to surrender quietly and be arraigned over Zoom, but chose a midday, high-profile booking at the Manhattan Courthouse in order to make it clear that he's being crucified and is happy to take the heat so his followers don't have to. Note, to our knowledge, none of Trump's supporters have falsified business records to cover up a six-figure payment to an adult film star while running for President of the United States. It's kind of a Jesus Christ thing. A source familiar with Trump's legal team told the outlet. He is saying, I'm absorbing all this pain from all around, from everywhere, so you don't have to. And if they can do this to me, they can do this to you. That's a powerful message. While the Secret Service, which is required by law to protect Trump at all times, reportedly argued in favour of holding the proceedings outside of court business hours at night, with minimal cameras and less risk, Trump, according to Rolling Stone source, wants to create the type of scene that he believes will galvanise his supporters. Nevertheless, it does show that this writer doesn't actually understand the way that Donald Trump functions and operates, because they're trying to suggest that he's adopting a martyr approach. That isn't his style at all. They're right about it being a crucifixion, but it's not the crucifixion of Donald Trump. Donald Trump sees that he's going to crucify those that oppose him. Those that cast judgment upon him. The district attorney, the presiding judge, relevant members of the press. And he isn't afraid to take them on. With his typical bullish approach, if your standpoint is one of condemnation of him and criticism, which of course threatens his sense of control, then he will take a run at you and dismiss you. He will do so with an utterance of fake news. You're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. You're corrupt. You're politically motivated in a witch hunt. Trump doesn't play the victim. Of course he has a victim mentality, because all narcissists do. But because he's not mid-range, it isn't as prevalent as the victim mentality that a mid-range narcissist would put forward. Instead, he sees himself as an all-conquering hero that is there not absorbing the pain on behalf of other people, but doling out the pain to others who deserve it on behalf of his followers, who he sees as deserving better. 
His grandiosity as such is that he sees himself as that all-conquering hero that rides into battle on behalf of others to slay the dragons, to drain the swamp. It isn't the case of him crucifying himself, but rather to crucify others. Now, it's evident that Vanity Fair has something of an agenda with regard to Donald Trump describing in such a way, and thereafter, of course, in the article, provides various aspect, various highlights from Twitter, mocking him for a failure to name a single verse from the Bible and so forth. However, the fact is that Vanity Fair's attempt to say that Trump adopts a martyr approach is completely wide of the mark. He is a no-nonsense individual. And for him, it is, of course, important for him to have that platform. So they were partially correct in terms of him wanting to stage something which was dramatic. He doesn't skulk around in the shadows. He isn't covert in his behaviours. He's overt, obvious, up front and centre, demonstrating that he is the one that must be talked about, that what he says is right, and that anybody else says that's contrary to him, basically it's fake news and that they are stupid. He doesn't shirk from what's in front of him. He's bring it on. I'll take all of this on and I'll do so with a maximum glare of publicity because he's loving every second of it. Whilst there might be some who would think he doesn't want his dirty linen aired in public, well, of course he doesn't because that would be a threat to control, but the fact is these allegations are out there now, and therefore he is going to utilise them as an opportunity to, for him to crucify his opponents and drink in all of that delicious fuel that's created by the repeated repertage about this ongoing case. He loves every second of the combative nature of this, staring the judge in the eye, snorting at the district attorney, shaking his head, rejecting what is being said about him. He's Donald Trump. He's the expert. He knows precisely how it is, and he knows that he is correct. We only have to look at his deliberate courthouse appearance as reported in the Telegraph, which explains that from the comfort of his Midtown hotel room, Donald Trump posted to his social media followers on Tuesday morning that the case against him was a politically motivated witch hunt, smearing, deflection, nullification of threat to control. It was a clear injustice, he wrote defiantly. This is not what America was supposed to be. Grandiosity, call to arms. Just a few hours later, however, the former President of the United States was on his way to answer 34 felony charges at Manhattan's criminal court and facing possible jail time. He had trailed the news of his own arrest weeks earlier, but it was only now the reality of his legal predicament seemed to be sinking in. Seems so surreal. Wow, I can't believe it, he wrote in a final post on his Truth Social page before being forced to turn off his phone by courtroom officials. It was an extraordinary moment on an extraordinary day. In the dock of the federal court at 2.35pm EST, Mr Trump stood before Judge Juan Moishan, humbled as the 76-year-old was taken to task over the post. Believe me, Donald Trump was not humbled at all. Please refrain from making statements likely to incite violence or civil unrest, challenge fuel. Judge Moshan, who had himself become a target of Mr Trump's digital wrath, ordered the former president as the defendant stared blankly on. Wearing his signature dark blue suit and red tie, Mr Trump was made to listen as prosecutors read out some of the most incendiary of the social media diatribes. Mr Trump's attorney argued unsuccessfully that their client was simply expressing his First Amendment rights and that the posts were in response to frustration over public comments made to the press by witnesses in the case. Those comments, of course, were a threat to control, so he needs to respond to it. Jed Merchant cautioned Mr Trump against making any further statements online that could prejudice any further trial, though stopped short of a gag order, saying such a measure should only be taken in the most extreme of circumstances. Mr Trump listened to the warnings and asked if he be understood. He said, yes, or I do, and at one point thanked the judge. 
The Queens-born businessman was impeached twice by the US House, has bounced back from bankruptcy six times, and is currently facing multiple investigations into parts of his business, public and personal life. His years of evading legal accountability, lack of accountability sense of entitlement, had earned Mr Trump the nickname Teflon Don. It finally appeared to have caught up with him, however, on Tuesday in courtroom 59, where disgraced Hollywood film director Harvey Weinstein met his fate. The 45th President of America entered the courtroom close behind his legal team with a solemn, slow and deliberate pace. He's doing that, of course, to draw attention to him. He made a point of looking at each row, staring at reporters. Intimidation, assertion of control. Security was extraordinarily tight, reflecting the unprecedented nature of the hearing. Every row of the public gallery had been taped off and was guarded by one of the 20-odd New York court officers wearing stab-proof vests and armed with handcuffs. On the front row were Secret Service officers, members of Mr Trump's legal team and attorneys from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. No family was present, as is customary for arraignment hearings. Mr Trump briefly looked over in the direction of a small gaggle of photographers who were given just a minute to snap pictures of the former president, provision of fuel, from the jury box before the official hearing started. The former reality star's famous orange glow seemed more suited to a TV courtroom than the drab reality of the Manhattan hearing. The 45-minute hearing was over with a characteristically outspoken Mr Trump uttering just 10 words, two of which were not guilty. Minutes later, outside the courtroom, Todd Blanche, Mr Trump's lead counsel, told reporters of the former president's response to the indictment. When you say what his reaction was, what do you think his reaction was? He's frustrated and upset. But we're going to fight it. He's upset, but he's motivated. This, of course, is demonstrative of his need to nullify the threat to control posed by these proceedings. If Mr Trump appeared measured, polite and deferential in court, his arrival was anything but. Moments before leaving Trump Tower in Midtown Manhattan, Mr Trump wrote on Truth Social, heading to Lower Manhattan, the courthouse, it seems so surreal. Wow, they are going to arrest me. Can't believe this is happening in America. MAGA. Provocation. As he left the building, he raised and pumped his fist in the air to greet supporters on the street before getting into a limousine. Provision of fuel. The public fascination with the case rose to something of a frenzy by the time of his court appearance. Helicopters buzzed in the skies as US networks carried every moment from his journey on board his personal plane, Trump Force One, through to the motorcade bringing him to court. All of this delicious fuel, the whole media circus that surrounds all of this, he'll be loving every moment of it. New Yorkers spent the day transfixed by the return of its prodigal son. Bankers on their way to work in Manhattan's financial district were glued to their phone screens. Coffee shops had 24-hour news on television screens checking for updates. It's like O.J. Simpson on steroids, said one barista, in reference to the breathless media coverage of the 1994 police chase of the American football player's Bronco down an L.A. freeway. It's a sign of the level of interest in the case that members of the media and public began queuing up outside the courthouse from 2pm on Monday, a full 24 hours ahead of Mr Trump's scheduled arraignment. Mr Trump knowing that, again, more fuel. One local blogger who was second in line was offering their ticket for $10,000 on social media. Again, the knowledge of that would fuel Donald Trump. Others, like Gregory Williams, a 57-year-old Bronx resident sitting on a folding chair next to a life-side cardboard cutout of Hillary Clinton, were just here to be part of history. All this is just a big show, Mr Williams said. I got the popcorn. This is American theatre at its best. And of course... The fact of it being American theatre at its best is something that would naturally appeal to Donald Trump. He loves all of the attention and he loves it being bold. He loves it being brash. He loves it, the circus. It's exactly what he wants. And the fact that they have brought these charges, which he will use to his benefit and look to nullify that threat to control, but also the fact that he's going to milk this for all that he can, not only in terms of looking to nullify the threat to control by saying that it's politically motivated, but also to generate so much more support for him than ordinarily he would have ever got. He's an expert at playing to the crowd. His narcissism knows those sound bites to issue to people. And 
by showing that he's going to be the one that crucifies his opponents. That acts as a rallying call to his supporters and provides him with even more fuel, which he loves. I'm H.T. Tudor. Thank you for listening.